morning. Um, as I began to draw um, the talk together on Friday morning, the news headlines were coming all flashing through um, about the, um, the tragic story of what was happening with, uh, with Jo Cox. And I fi- found myself simultaneously kind of thinking about her children, the questions that they will have now as they grow up, and of their, uh, of their father, her husband, of his questions, and also thinking about our nation and the questions I hoped and I hope that it will stir in our hearts and in our nation. You know, what have we done? What are we doing that creates a situation where our do- democracy is so devastatingly challenged? I'm sure the coming weeks we'll learn of the, the mental health issues that the accused is, uh, has been dealing with, his isolation uh, and the, the character things that associated with him. But, you know, will we reflect as a culture on the fear culture of fear that we've created, of uncertainty that is permeating through our politics, will we reflect on how we've eroded the very principles of democracy which we're here to establish peace, create accountability, to enable an honest and honouring debate, to present to people truth and enable people to make a choice for themselves. Former Prime Minister Gordon Brown published a statement which said, people will say that this does not happen in Britain, this should not happen in Britain, and we must resolve that this will never again happen in Britain. Jo Cox's sister in her statement yesterday made this comment, that we are to focus on that which unites us and not what on, and not which divides us. As we pray this week, as the representatives of God on earth whether or not you're coming together on the 23rd to pray as we make the decisions around Europe but can I encourage you to pray for her children her husband, her family for the leaders of this nation as Paul said Um, to pray for this nation and to pray for the church in this nation we know as we've sung this morning that the answers are found in him and that's where we need to go to the narrative on Joe Cox's GoFundMe webpage, which was set up 24 hours after her death, has already and has already raised this morning over 600,000 pounds, and over 19,000 people have have made gifts to it. It concludes with this statement: "Let's come together and give what we can to create that better world." Giving is in the heart of our God. It is the heart of the gospel. Without the principle of giving, the very nature of God will be inconsistent. God is love, and giving with the right heart and motive is the perfect expression of love. We are called to be that expression. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone, everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Can we pray also for the man that's accused of the murder of Joe Cox too? If the world, us, would not have been formed, the gospel would be powerless unless giving was present within the Trinity. As I said, it is the very nature of God to give, to share, to be generous. It's part of defining who he is. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relationship is dependent on giving and sharing. The Father gave his Son. The Father gave glory to his Son. The Son gives glory to his Father. He gives glory to those who love him. The Spirit gives comfort. He gives peace. He gives help to please God. At this time, we need the Spirit to give comfort and to give peace. If God is not giving, he is not God. He is not true to himself. And he is not loving. He is not complete. Now this nature of God is also ours. We are made in his image. The fullness of who we are can only be made complete if we are giving and if we are generous. If not, something wouldn't be right. Something would be missing. Recall the stirring in your heart when you have given generously. Perhaps a gift perhaps of your time to someone maybe they didn't even know about it 
or when someone just shares something with you that you gave to them and it was just in passing and it's had a profound impact and how that makes your heart feel. There's something at the core of us that resonates with a warmth when we've given something. Not a pride that wants us to tell others what we've done. Not a sense of, but, sorry, but a sense of peace, of deep joy of perhaps doing something in secret, not for reward, but because it was right to do. We often talk here about the importance of our identity in Christ and of that being of pivotal importance. And giving will be a display of that identity. Today, up and down the country, churches will be commenting on what's happened in the week, and not just with Joe Cox, but what's happened in Orlando as well. As many people in this world grieve, and these are the things that just make our news headlines because we know it goes on all the time. And God's response into all of this was to give and to give Jesus. What's our response to his giving, to his love? I still felt prompted to share a little bit on how, what our main topic is of today, so I'm going to do that um, just very briefly, if I can do, uh, which is about giving of our resources and of our finances, but it's the heart of giving which is really important to to us to grapple with and I'm, my hope and prayer is that as we share together that something will be released that something of the spirit of God will be released in us and will stir our heart in giving of all of the things that we have and of ourselves I'm not going to spend time on, dis on a detailed discussion on a definition of what tithing means I'm more than happy to do that um, simply Abby and I use um, 10% of our gross impact, uh, gross income as a guide. Then that comes to the church community in which we belong and which we're part of. We believe that this is honouring of those that God has called to lead us and allow us as a church to respond to the individual, and it allows us as a church to respond to the individual needs and local needs and international needs. That God has called us, his community here in Southampton to, to do at this time. The presentation of the tithe to the church is also an expression of our unity. It's a statement which counters the individualism of the predominant Western view that we must first look after our so ourselves. I wonder how much of that thinking has been going on today, this last week and the last few months, that has influenced the politics that we've got around at the moment. Our giving, our tithing to the church, it says our unity is more important than my needs and its expression of submission. It's no wonder that God releases a blessing where there is unity. And the blessing will be for all those that partake in that unity and will extend way beyond that group. Over and above our tithe is an offering, which could be to the church, it could be to a person, it could be a charity, it could be one off. And we believe that God has given us a choice as to how we show generosity in that way. What is it that's perhaps poured on our hearts that we want to give our time, our resources, our money to? Or maybe a combination of all of those. Don't know about you, but I find it difficult sometimes to say no to things. But I know that God asks me to pray in wisdom as to where I should give things. As we continue, I just want to look at three texts. And, I, and as I've said, I hope it will release something of God for us in this area. Firstly, I want you to look at our faithfulness in small things. Luke 16 says this. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your earthly possessions are gone, they will welcome you into an eternal home. If you are faithful in the little things, you will be faithful in the large ones. But if you are dishonest in the little things, you, will be, you won't be honest with the greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other one. You cannot serve God and money both equally. 
Um, I just wanted to share a short video to kind of illustrate this. I don't know if you've seen this on Facebook. Apologies if you had. I don't think it's been shown here before. Um, but it's just a story to illustrate what giving can communicate. I wonder if at the beginning of time when God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit sat down and said, when we create man in our image, how will they know that we love them? And which one of the three of them said, do you know what? Giving is the best communication. And the Father looked at the Son. I wonder if that was the conversation. It was just a story, but it does illustrate for me something about the power of giving, that we don't know what we will reap when we sow generously. That out of that man's poverty in that situation, he just sowed something. And what he reaped, he could not have imagined. That is true, and, and 2 Corinthians 9, 6, 9 says this, about the farmer who plants a few seeds will get a small crop, but those who plant generously will get a, a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly in response to pressure for God loves a cheerful giver or gives cheer, loves a person who gives cheerfully. For me, you know, sometimes we think, well, we have to give out lots now and then, but this, the constant act of giving and giving generously over time, consistently, continuously, 
who knows what we'll reap. Finally, God says, final verse just to look at, um, is from Malachi 3 verse 10. It says this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be Uh, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to eat, not be room enough to store it. This is the only situation in the Bible where God says, test me. He doesn't say, test me and then give. The principle here is actually bring the whole house, the whole tithe in. Test me. There's something first that we need to respond to. The Hebrew word for test in this verse, and Bev is looking at me going, why did you introduce the Hebrew? You've got to do it once, Bev, isn't it? Is, uh, uh, is bakan, which means to examine, scrutinize, or prove, as in gold. Just as gold is tested with fire to prove its quality, God invites Israel in this passage, invites us to test him in tithes and offerings and see that he will prove his faithfulness in response. Proverbs 3 says, Honour the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest, then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will be overflowing with new wine. It's our experience, and I say our experience, it's Abby and I's experience that when we align ourselves on tithing and generosity, that things financially just seem to go better. A discount on a train ticket that we didn't expect. Something on offer when we needed it to be. Something that could easily be fixed when actually if it was difficult, you know, it was going to cost us a lot of money. Something that we thought we needed when actually in reality, when we didn't have it, we no longer needed it. An unexpected gift, something just arriving, a refund on something that we didn't expect, the generosity of a friend for no reason, work coming in from unexpected places. The list goes on, and when you add them up, you add them up, and you look at our accounts our finances the math the maths just does not make sense at all i tried to write a formula i was thinking about pete ingleby i was trying to write a formula for it this week you know when we take when we've got this and we take away this because we've given it as a tithe or as a gift that what we've got left is more than what we had the maths just didn't work out i like the fact that god is the author of maths clearly with my son uh, when he's doing his sacks, I'm making sure he's giving the right answer rather than the kingdom answer, because otherwise uh, they don't understand it. Since giving up working for Accenture, there's been moments of real challenge uh, to my peace in this area. Our income was a fraction of what we needed to cover our outgoings. The maths just didn't add up. My Excel spreadsheets were showing a distinct phase of red all over them. Yet we have maintained the principle of tithing and offering. Through the last three years, I can honestly say that we have not gone without. That God has been faithful. No more than that. We've been able to do more than we had hoped for or expected to. We've not just survived, but I think we've thrived. Within a month of leaving Accenture, our car developed a terminal fault. Um, And uh, as you know, we need a slightly large vehicle transport our small team around Um, and uh, for the first time in my situation in life I was faced I couldn't get a loan I had no employment but yet at that time some finances were released to us to cover most of the cost of the vehicle and then on Abby's income we were able to secure a loan for the, the remainder of it we had some unexpected bills running into the thousands and some inheritance came through and enabled us to pay this, but not just to pay those, but to bless others and, uh, and also at his request, create a memory for our children. We found some after school clubs, which were really good value that some friends recommended. Kids clothes that we've shared out over the time came back to us with more in them. 
better quality than the ones that we'd sent out. Our children were growing out of their clothes and people were passing them to us and they still do and they look new. When our children wear clothes and we pass them out, they look very well worn in. But yet what comes back is so much more than what we could have hoped for. Friends offering to do things, offering at a discount. Now I never rely on mates rates. I always think it's right to pay people what it's due. But when they offer it, I often don't decline. It's always a blessing when they offer it and I would wouldn't want to rob them of that blessing of their generosity the charity order trust which um, i've shared about before about changing the soil it relies predominantly on the giving of others and we've been able to impact so many small projects but big projects as well safe families being part of healthy homes being part of the safeguarding network doing campaigns on safeguarding um, across the city we currently employ three people part-time Where has the finances come from for that? Through the giving and generosity of others. Clear, the generosity of this church has now had an extremely large grant from the lottery that you know about. It's been in its strongest financial position ever. Edith's home, again, the generosity of people and here and others finds itself being able to give more, do more than ever before. The church has released money from our gift aid into putting it into youth work in this city which has been eroded over the last few years. We are countering what's going on in the city because we know investing in our young people is absolutely pivotal. It is our testimony, my testimony, our experience that as we maintain a focus on giving of our tithe, of being generous, that we have lacked nothing. Some might say we can't afford to give. Our testimony is that we can't afford not to. It's not difficult for God to say, test me in this. However, because he knows his resources are limitless, the difficulty is our belief in the unwavering, unmerited faithfulness of God to us. The world needs a God who who gave, who gives. The world needs a church to model giving, unity, truth and peace, not as a to-do, but because it's the very core of her being. Peter, in response to the request from the beggar asking for money, said, and I paraphrase, I don't have money to give you, but what I do have, I do give you. Here is Jesus. As the band come back up, let's just pray. Sorry? Have we not got time for the band? We've not got time for the band, but let's just pray. Let's pray. Father, we um, we thank you, Lord, that giving is at the the core of who you are. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the stories of hearing those people that have given their lives to you in Reading these last few weeks. And Lord, we ask that that would increase. We want more of that. We want to see more of Jesus being glorified. That is our heart's cry. And that we as the church in this nation, Lord, will be there to comfort and to walk with those that are in pain, that are, in, that are isolated, that are lonely, that are grieving. Because that's what you've called us to be, is to journey life with people and to share Jesus with them whenever we can. And so, Father, we ask for your blessing this week. We ask, Lord in all that's happening in our nation, that your will will be done. That as we come together to vote on Thursday of this week, we ask, Lord, that your spirit would hover over us as we vote. Lord, as we look at our own giving and tithing and generosity, we ask that the very heart of God, of your very heart, will be present in us as we explore those things together. We want to be a church that is giving of you, giving of ourselves, giving worship to you and glorifying you in all.